this computer. Okay. We're... All right. Good. Good. So I'll, I'll, all right. Um, hi all. Um, welcome to the second chaos talk of the year. Um, today we've got Kit Chapman giving a talk about how we got to creating super heavy elements. He sadly couldn't be here today, so he's giving his lecture over Zoom. But we still got pizza and stuff. The pizza will be in Fizzbar at seven o'clock, something around then, whenever delivery driver gets here. Um, his talk today is based off his book uh, Super Heavy. Um, and he has since had a uh, race in green published, which is a look into how motorsport science can help the fight against climate change. He has also written articles for the Daily Telegraph, New Scientist and Nature, and he's given talks all over the world. Um, next week, we've got a careers talk uh, organized by our careers rep Giacomo. Um, this is going to be by Bristol alumni, Dr. Andy Humphreys, who is going to uh, give a talk on his his company Infinitesima, uh, a semiconductor startup. And the following week, um, we've got a talk by Mikhail Zilkin, who's going to talk about his work as a data scientist at Arsenal FC. Um, both of these are here on Wednesdays, same time. And so, with that, I will give it up to to Kit. Random thoughts. To you. Hello, yeah. everyone. Um, thank you for that warm introduction. And I'm sorry that I don't work with Arsenal. Uh, I'm a Leeds fan. That's like an anathema to me. Um, I'm also really sorry I can't be with you today. Um, I was fully intending to come, but as you might know, there is a train strike. Um, and so I was preparing to drive down. And last night I thought, well, my electric's going up, my gas is going up. I might as well help my car premiums go up as well. And um, had a little car, car whoopsie. So I couldn't make it, unfortunately. And I'm having to do the talk remotely. I'm about to share my screen and I'm going to talk to you about super heavy elements, how and why we make them. But that's not the only thing that I'm happy to talk to you about. If you want to know about science journalism, I'm more than happy to talk about it. Uh, travel during the pandemic. Um, I visited 77 countries around the world, um, mostly during the pandemic, um, to look at science stories. Part of the thing that gets me up in the morning and gets me excited about science is finding how it relates to our real world and exploring the histories of science. Um, and I'm happy to talk about Formula One racing as well. My latest book is Racing Green, which is about spin-off technologies that have emerged from motorsport. So things like uh, in supermarkets using um, uh, aerodynamics to control the flow of cold air to reduce our CO2 footprint, that stems from Formula One. That's all done by Formula One teams, uh, particularly Williams in the United Kingdom. So I'm gonna give you my screen up now. Um, fingers crossed, this is all going to work. Let's share this. And let's go from the beginning. Just for, I'll just move, uh, I'll minimize this. And so it's just just you, just your slides right now, if that's okay. That's fine, no problem at all. Um, if my slides suddenly vanish or if I break connection, please do give me a yell. Um, so this talk is about how to discover an element. And it's not just the discovery that matters. As you'll see, there's a lot of polit politicalization of uh, element discovery. Um, particularly during the Cold War, it was a battle between the United States and the USSR. And even today, there is a lot of political debate about the discovery of elements. We have big question marks whether we're going to have elements 119 and 120. We thought we were going to have them in five years. Certainly the Japanese team is still working on that. But of course, the war in the Ukraine has influenced whether the United States and Russia can work together um, collaboratively as they've done in the past. So this is the periodic table. I appreciate that you're physicists and that you don't need to know this um, horrible, scary chemistry thing. Um, but this is how it, as it might have looked in the 1930s. And you'll notice that there are bits that are missing. We didn't have element 43 at the time. In fact, um, this periodic table would never have actually looked this way because multiple people were claiming to have element 43. And there's a very case, famous case of a Japanese scientist, Masasaka Ogawa, uh, thinking he discovered it and calling it Neponium. Um, later it emerged that he probably discovered Rhenium element 75. So we've still got bits missing, the jigsaw puzzle isn't complete, and you'll notice down the bottom there, um, if you're keen-eyed, we have Uranium, uh, Thorium, and Protactinium um, down there in completely the wrong place. We don't actually have an actinide series in this periodic table, everything's a bit wrong. The periodic table today, of course, looks more like this. And those elements, those red blocked elements that I've got at the bottom there are the super heavies. Now, the reason that we've discovered this is we have started to produce elements that are heavier than uranium. 
Uranium is the heaviest element that is stable long enough to actually exist on Earth. Bear in mind, radioactivity means that elements, all, all elements break down pretty much and you get some stabilization around lead. But anything heavier than uranium, with very few examples of isotopes um, being slightly different, there is an isotope of plutonium that's actually quite long lived. Generally speaking, um, they are too unstable to have existed since our Earth's formation, and you won't be able to find them in rock. You can, of course, find them if they uh, break down through radioactivity uh, naturally. We've had cases in the past uh, when the Earth was forming of natural, um, natural nuclear reactors, essentially, uh, particularly under the Gabon in, uh, in Africa. But you do see this in pitch blend as well. The red block, though, is where we're going to focus. That are, that's the super heavy elements. We have Rutherfordium, Dubnium, Seborgium, Borium, Hassium, Mitnerium, Darmstadtium, Rottengenium, Copernicium, Nihonium, Fluorovium, Moscovium, Livermorium, Tennessine, and Oganesson, um, which is quite a mouthful to say. Now, normally in these kind of talks, I would ask you to come up with your own names for elements. I always find it absolutely fascinating uh, what students would choose to call a new element, whether they know the rules that do exist about how you name elements. Um, usually at least one person will also suggest an element that exists, most commonly oxygen. Um, for some reason, people just want to name another element oxygen. Um, mm -hmm. Always baffles me. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that because of the remoteness, although there is a, uh, a little demonstration we'll do a bit later on that, uh, that <laughs> William was very, very kindly said he will uh, do on my behalf. Um, and if you don't like William, you're going to have a great time, um, particularly if he picks you as a volunteer. So moving on, who discovers elements? I always bring this slide up because there is this perception in science that science is done by old white men. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the Nobel Prize is rife with that. We've had just today, for example, 191 Nobel laureates now in chemistry, of whom eight are women, and we have had precisely zero black chemists winning the Nobel Prize. Who discovers elements are wide ranging. The chap there on the far left is Glenn Seaborg. Uh, Seaborg was a chemist, but he worked with Ernest Lawrence at the Radiation Laboratory in University of California, Berkeley in the late 1930s and mid 1940s. He stayed on until the, the 1990s at Berkeley. And he's in his 30s there, quite a young man still. Um, and he is on the show Quiz Kids. This is the 11th of November, 1945. The Second World War has just ended. And this was kind of a show that was like mastermind for kids. So kids would be asked questions on science, on history, on geography. And if they could get the questions right, they would win uh, money towards their scholarship. They would get to pay their college tuition. Now, Glenn Seaborg was invited on as an element discoverer. He had just announced the discovery of plutonium because obviously at the end of the Second World War, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs go off. Everyone knows that atomic power exists and they know that this element plutonium was part of the Nagasaki bomb. The Hiroshima bomb was a uranium bomb. And so he's asked to talk about how elements are discovered. And one of the quiz kids asks him a question, Dr. Seaborg, have any more elements been discovered recently? Now, Glenn Seaborg, unwilling, unable to turn down such a golden opportunity to talk about his work, uh, when actually, Dick, um, I should point out the kid's name was Richard, so he wasn't just being rude. Um, actually, Dick, two elements have just been discovered here at the, the Met Lab in Chicago. Um, we haven't named them yet. Perhaps people can suggest names. Those elements were americium and curium, discovered during the Manhattan Project, during the, the, the attempt to build the atomic weapons during the Second World War. Um, he had several element names suggested to him. Um, some were rude, some were polite. Uh, we can go into those a little bit later if you like. But americium, an incredibly important element, we now use that in smoke detectors around the world. Curium we use for, um, for several different um, pharmacological treatments, so it's used in, in radio medicine. This is the only time, as far as I'm aware, that an element discovery has been announced on national radio live, um, and the only time that it has been sponsored by Alka-Seltzer. This is Dawn Shaughnessy. Dawn has discovered five elements. She is the most successful female um, element discoverer in the world. Um, she's tied with uh, Nancy Stoyer, who also works on her team. And Dawn works at uh, Lawrence Livermore, just outside San Francisco in California. 
She's an incredibly good chemist um, and she partners with the Russians, or she did. At the moment, obviously, the partnership, as I say, incredibly strained because of the war in Ukraine. And so what happens is a Livermore uses their expertise with analysis and proving uh, that an element creation has happened, which is an incredibly difficult process because effectively you are, as we'll go into, trying to pull a needle out of the haystack and the needle vanishes in 0.2 milliseconds. So incredibly difficult to actually prove that you've got that in your raw data. But Dawn is the most successful of all time. Um, many people would say Marie Curie. Marie Curie only had two. So Dawn is beating her by three already. This is Glenn Seaborg's team in the 1970s. Uh, it includes James Harris, um, who was the first black chemist to discover an element. There have been more. Um, a good example is Clarice Phelps, uh, who currently works at Oak Ridge in Tennessee. Uh, and we have the Escalas, Perco Escala, uh, there on the left of Glenn Seaborg. Um, she was a fantastic scientist. Because of the 1970s and, and sexual discrimination, often when she answered the phone, people would assume that she was the secretary and be asked to be put onto one of the element discovery team. She discovered two elements. The chap on the far right there is Albert Giorso. And Al is incredibly important because he never had anything more than a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. And yet he is the most successful element discoverer of all time. Um, he absolutely trounces Humphrey Davy. And Al's genius was that he was a fantastic tinkerer. He was famous for coming up with some quirky lab solutions, not all of which would be allowed today. For example, to get uh, the element Mendelevium discovered, element 101, he realized that he had to get his sample from the, uh, the cyclotron where they were making the element to the chemistry lab so they could isolate that element uh, and get it out of the, uh, the gold target. And they needed to do it as rapidly as possible. How did he do it? Uh, he supercharged a Volkswagen Beetle and did the experiments at midnight and then just gunned it up the hill as fast as he could, literally <laughs> running with a vial of acid with his thumb over it. Um, into the Volkswagen Beetle. There is film of them doing it. You can find this online. Um, it's a fantastic clip. Um, and that is how they discover Mendelevium, literally a Volkswagen Beetle that had been supercharged by Albert Giorso. So very eccentric chap. But this kind of shows you that anyone can discover elements, all kinds of different teams all working together. Um, this is Kasuki Morita. He is the first element discoverer from Japan. Uh, as you can see, he's a little bit quirky. He, his efforts were so remarkable. It took him nine years to discover an element. So to discover an element, you need to actually have reproducibility. Of course, you can't just say that you've discovered the element and there's my data and, and we'll move on from that. In fact, someone have, people have tried to do that and um, have tried to defraud the system. A guy called Viktor Ninov uh, in the early 2000s um, and late 1990s tried that and was proven to have essentially faked the data to discover element 118. So you need to do have reproducibility. And Marita's team worked, they were using a process called cold fusion, uh, which is a real thing in element discovery. Uh, I'll go into it a little bit later on. And he found that it was incredibly tough to get multiple hits essentially. So he got two hits pretty quickly, but he was waiting, as I say, in total nine years to get that third hit. They were gonna shut down the experiment uh, and then the Fukushima disaster happened. So tsunami hit the Fukushima nuclear power plant and <coughs> power became premium in the, in, uh, in, across Japan. It was very, very expensive. He was told to shut down all experiments except one and he could pick which one he, he wanted to do. He decided to keep with element discovery and shortly after he got his third ping. This was an incredible coup for Japan. As I mentioned, um, Nipponium and, uh, and the work of um, Masataka Ogawa uh, in the early uh, 20th century, people thought that, um, that Japan would never get their element. He did, he, he got element 113, it's Nipponium, and he became such a celebrity that they actually made a manga comic about him, um, which is not quite as cool as winning a Nobel Prize, but I don't have a comic written about me, so I think that's pretty sweet. And that kind of gives you an idea of the spectrum of people who discover elements. It's all kinds of people, all kinds of walks of life. If you want to do this, you can absolutely get into it. 
So today we're going to talk about making Element 120. Uh, there I am actually in Japan. This is some of the team who discovered Nihonium. Um, it's a Riken, uh, which is just outside uh, Tokyo. It's a, in a place called Waco City, um, and it's fantastic. From the entrance to the, the, the train station that they've got in Japan, all the way to Riken's buildings, they've actually installed gold plaques of the periodic table, and you follow the route. Um, it starts just outside of KFC for some reason, and it leads all the way into their gate. So I've actually been to the place where they discovered element 113. And we're going to talk about making element 120. The reason we're doing 120 rather than 119 is that elements that are evenly numbered uh, with the number of protons are a little bit more stable, and therefore we have a better shot of making them. Unfortunately, we can't use our golden tool anymore, which is calcium 48. I'll come into why later. Let's have an idea of how unstable the super heavy elements are. As I mentioned, they vanish in seconds, and that's a big problem when you're trying to show the ability. So I'm going to press a button, and these are going to vanish in real time. We have Nihonium uh, down at the end there, 9.5 seconds. Borovium, 19 seconds. That's kind of interesting. That's because um, it's got uh, on, it's on what we call the island of stability or the edge of the island of stability. Uh, for those who are familiar with Maria Gopomea and her idea of um, essentially magic numbers, um, which she won the Nobel Prize for, this is because it has a magic number of protons and neutrons, almost a magic number of neutrons. Uh, Moscovium, 650 milliseconds, uh, 57 milliseconds for Livermorium, Tennessee, 51, right down to Oganess on 0.69 milliseconds. So here they are, they're going to vanish in real time. Three, two, one, gone. Off they go. Nihonium hangs around for a little bit longer, but it goes in three, <coughs> two, one. I never get that timing right. Never. Oh, well, and you see fluorovium has hanging around a bit longer. As I say, it's on an island of stability. So when we talk about the stability of isotopes, we always talk about things being on this peninsula going forward. The most common isotopes, of course, are the most stable, they're most long lived. As we move away from that, as we diverge uh, with either um, a, a lack of neutrons or more neutrons, things become more unstable in the nucleus. It wants to break apart and eventually we have shorter half-lives. When we get these magic numbers, we do get an island of stability and things can hang around a little bit longer. Ideally, we want to actually nudge more neutrons somehow when we're making our fluorovium so that we can hit that island of stability. If we can do that, potentially, it could last for minutes, hours, days. We just don't know. Problem is, we still haven't worked out how to do that. So that leads to a very good question. Why bother making something that lasts fractions of a second? What is the point of this weird end of the periodic table as we're at the moment? And I should stress, it's not the end of the periodic table entirely. We think we've probably only discovered at best two thirds of the periodic table. <coughs> there are several reasons. You could do it for fame and glory. That absolutely happened during the Cold War. People wanted to have the opportunity to name the elements. And we actually got into a naming war. It was known as the Transfermium War. It lasted roughly 40 years between the US and USSR teams. We've got Tony Stark there discovering an element. Um, fact, I, I mean, Iron Man 2, terrible movie. That's probably the best part of it. And completely garbage science. That's not how you discover an element. Just hoping that your dad's left some plans. Uh, in an architectural drawing. But potentially there's amazing power there. As you all know, the bigger we, we get with our, with our atoms, the bigger we get with our nucleus, um, the more potential power we have uh, because E equals MC squared, uh, M being mass, higher mass means that we have potentially more power uh, that can be unleashed with a single, um, a single atom. And of course, the mysteries of the universe. We want to know how things are put together. Super heavy elements, as I said, don't exist on Earth. They exist in neutron star collisions because of the number of neutrons we need flying around. They exist in supernovae blowing up. And so to understand how the universe is constructed, the fabric of the universe, how things interact with each other, the core questions of physics, we need to have the chemistry there as well. And you'll notice with the super heavy elements that the idea of chemistry and physics really aren't separate. It becomes a combined discipline where you find chemists doing physics and you'll find physicists doing chemistry. But here's a really good reason. The periodic table is wrong. Um, and as a chemist, this makes me very, very sad because I like to trust the periodic table. It's my roadmap. 
Noble gases, they are supposed to be unreactive. We all know this. Complete shells, complete, complete electron shells, and gases at room temperature. That's why we call them the noble gases. Um, so on the left there, we have xenon, radon, and organesson as their electron shells should be appearing. This is work done by Peter Schwerdferger in New Zealand, uh, supported by Michigan State University and Vitek Nazaritz. The problem is that's theoretically what doesn't happen. We're still on the very, very basic level um, being able to do experiments on super heavy elements. Anything past fluorovium, maybe a little bit of coponesium, a um, bit more coponesium. It's very, very difficult to actually do any practical experiments because they are incredibly short lived. And how do you get them to your experiment? What can you actually do in, in under a second? So a lot of this work is theoretical, but we believe that the periodic table shows that a loss of periodicity. Now you'll be familiar with the idea of losing periodicity uh, in periodic table uh, because of electron shell configurations. Um, this is basic physics, it's basic chemistry as well. Gold is a gold color because of this, mercury is a liquid because of this. But we believe that organesson, as you can see, those electron shells really don't exist in any kind of defined pattern. We believe that organesson is reactive. We think it has no electron shells really, it's just kind of electron soup. And it's a solid at room temperature. So the idea of the noble gases kind of ends there. And that, as for a chemist, is fascinating because the periodic table's layout suddenly doesn't make any more sense after, uh, after we finish the super heavies where we are. Where element 119 and 120 will go, we're pretty certain they're group one, group two. But after that, we have absolutely no idea. Element 121 is a complete question mark and there are multiple theories about where it would fit on the periodic table, how it would behave, uh, what elements it would be um, homologous to. So potentially we could see a change in how the periodic table is structured based on the physical properties of the nucleus. So how do we actually make these elements? Is it just a case of smashing things together? Uh, we've got a nice little um, little carbon there. It's absolutely not hurting anybody. Got a lovely number of protons, which are the blue. I know protons aren't blue. Let's just go with it. Um, and neutrons there. I appreciate, again, neutrons and protons, not quite the same size, um, but they are there. Just go with it. Do they just smash together? Well, of course they don't. As you know, neutrons are have neutral charge. Protons, however, are positively charged. And we have the Coulomb barrier. That causes repulsion and things just bounce away. Now that's integral to our understanding of the nucleus. So how do we actually get things to nudge up the periodic table? Because as you know, the element is decided by the number of protons it has. One proton is hydrogen, two is helium, three lithium, four beryllium, so on and so on. What about neutrons? As I mentioned, neutrons don't have char uh, charge, so they can slip straight through the Coulomb barrier without any problem. Now, if we can get the neutrons to stay put, that's fantastic because beta minus radiation means that potentially beta minus decay means that a proton can turn, sorry, a neutron can turn into a proton. But most commonly of all, that doesn't happen. Nuclear fission happens and the whole thing just blows up because it's unstable. This is something that was discovered by Enrico Fermi in the 1930s. Re Enrico Fermi was working at the Via Panis Perna, uh, which was <coughs> in the center of Rome. Uh, you can go there today. It's now the Ministry of the Interior for Rome. And his patron was Benito Mussolini, uh, which is not a great patron to have. Um, but he was doing experiments on a budget, on a, sh on a shoestring. He actually had to hide behind uh, down the corridor uh, when he was doing his radioactivity experiments uh, because he didn't have any proper shielding. When he wanted to slow neutrons down, he actually discovered the fact that he could slow neutrons down. Um, he did it by jumping into uh, his fish pond outside the villa, um, screaming black magic, black magic. People thought he'd gone crazy. Um, so he started using neutrons and he was exploring the periodic table. He just wanted to see what happens if you fired neutrons at different elements. He actually got his neutron device, his neutron gun, by piping off radon gas from a safe down in the basement that another staff member was keeping. And he sent his team, which included um, Emilio Segre, um, running around Rome, gathering up samples of every single element he could find. Now, most elements would alpha decay, the loss of equivalent of a helium ion, basically, um, two protons, two neutrons. But when you get up to uranium, when you start getting to the heavier elements, 
beta decay is far more common. And if you have beta decay, beta minus decay, that means a neutron turns into a proton and element 92, uranium, becomes element 93. He didn't know about nuclear fission though. He missed that. He thought that what was happening was neutron capture. Now that does absolutely happen. And this is how we discovered element 43, technetium, uh, by taking molybdenum. Uh, this was done by Milo Segre and Carlo Pereira. They asked for some filters from a machine from Berkeley in California um, and said, can we have a look at them? Um, but Enrico Fermi was mistaken. He won the Nobel Prize uh, for discovering <laughs> capture and for discovering elements beyond uranium because he thought he had discovered elements no, no, 93 and 94. In fact, he hadn't. He found out a month afterwards uh, from work done by Otto Hahn and Lise Meitner um, that what actually happened was nuclear fission. His elements had exploded and he was looking at samples of krypton and barium. Great physicist, not particularly a great chemist. It was a really lucky thing that he won that Nobel Prize though, because Enrico Fermi used that as an excuse to escape Italy. He, as I said, was the, uh, his benefactor was Benito Mussolini, but his wife, Helen, was Jewish and Jews were starting to be persecuted in 1938 in Italy. And so he said, Benito, I'm gonna go over to Stockholm and I am gonna pick up my Nobel Prize. Of course, I'm gonna take my family with me. It's the biggest day of my life. Uh, I'll be right back to Italy, I promise. Of course, what he did was he hopped on the first boat he could to America and, and went over to Columbia. So um, Columbia University, not, not Columbia, the country. So incredibly lucky that he did win the Nobel Prize, but it was a mistake. Nuclear fission was happening. And nuclear fission is why people started to become immediately interested in this element discovery process, because as you all know, nuclear fission is what makes an atom bomb work. And we're on the cusp of the Second World War. In 1939, everyone starts looking at this. Albert Einstein writes a very, very famous letter um, uh, encouraged, encouraged by, uh, by Leo um, Zillard uh, to the president, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and saying, you really need to look at uh, uh, making bombs potentially out of this. Uh, always regrets the letter, but that starts the ball rolling for the Americans and nuclear projects. So everyone's really interested in this. But what about element creation? At Berkeley, as I mentioned, Glenn Seaborg was there. Uh, he was with a guy called Edwin McMillan. And Edwin McMillan was looking at, uh, at nuclear fish, fission, and he noticed that while you get nuclear fission probably every you know, 9,999 9, times out of 10,000 with, with a the strike of your neutron, occasionally that neutron will stay in place and it will turn into something else. Uh, he was getting very interesting decays detected in his machine. Uh, he was using a cyclotron um, to, to speed things along type of particle accelerator actually invented uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. And he took this to Emilio Segre, who had also fled Italy, he was Jewish, and said, I think I've made a new element. And Segre's response was, you absolutely haven't, don't be silly. He wrote a letter to Nature, um, sorry, uh, no, it was a physical word, <sighs> sorry, um, and said, uh, an unsuccessful hunt for transuranic elements. As it happened, Edwin McMillan had made a new element. He had seen a, a neutron go into a, a, a uranium nucleus. That neutron stayed in place, it beats a decayed, and it turned into a proton. It turned into element 93, which was Neptunium. And from Neptunium, uh, McMillan joined by Seaborg. Uh, McMillan eventually left to do radar research during this, uh, the Second World War, um, discovered the next element, 94, which was, of course, plutonium. So this is actually why the elements are named that way. Uranium was named after the planet Uranus when it, because it was discovered at roughly the same time. And they literally just followed the order of the planets because at the time Pluto was a planet. So you have uranium, plutonium. And this kind of links to the problem. How do you actually manufacture it? How do you manufacture elements? How do you speed up the process? because Glenn Siebel realized that plutonium would be a far more powerful bomb than uranium. As I mentioned, people were looking at this, this in the Second World War. And his problem was how did he scale up making plutonium? Because if you're making it in a particle accelerator, if you're firing neutrons in there and hoping that they stay put, you're only making one atom at a time. He needed to scale this up a billion times. And the man that provided the answer was Enrico Fermi. Enrico Fermi built the first nuclear reactor known as the Chicago Pile 
um, actually under the bleachers of the sports stadium of the University of Chicago on a squash court. Um, and it's essentially a neutron bouncy castle. Neutrons are flying everywhere. And this is what you want because you feed in your uranium, neutrons strike it, and although you get lots and lots of nuclear fission, of course that happens far more commonly, occasionally you do get that beta plus, sorry, beta minus decay, and occasionally you do nudge one place up the periodic table. And so if you were going to discover elements today, you could, in theory, use a nuclear bomb to get that kind of neutron cloud that you need. 10 to the 24 neutrons per centimeter squared inside a thermonuclear device. We have actually used nuclear bombs to discover new elements. In the 1950s, Operation Ivy Mike uh, blew up any Wetak Atoll in the Pacific. It actually removed the island from the map. It literally blew the island off the face of the Earth. And the United States ordered fighter pilots to fly inside the nuclear mushroom cloud with filters on their wings, scoop up the debris and see what was inside them. And because we have that, Clouds of neutrons, 10 to the 24 neutrons per centimeter squared is absolutely massive. They were of course hitting atoms. And while most of those atoms were exploding, occasionally they were nudging one place at the periodic table. And if that happened several times, you would get heavier elements. So elements 99 and 100, fermium and Einsteinium, were both discovered from a nuclear blast, a nuclear test uh, of a thermonuclear weapon in the 1950s. It's worth pointing out that one of the pilots ordered to fly inside that mushroom cloud, a guy called Jimmy Robinson, died. He did not survive the experience. But these days, you'll be pleased to know, we do not use nuclear bombs to make element discoveries. There was a suggestion that we should do that. Um, a couple of people put a plan together of detonating nuclear bombs underground um, in a confined space and sort of a massive cluster of them just to try and make elements. But people don't like nuclear weapons for a very good reason. They're a bit dangerous. This is London. And if we detonated the Ivy Mike bomb, which was the one that discovered two elements, uh, we wouldn't have London anymore. Uh, everything within the M25 would pretty much be um, demolished. So let's look at other alternatives, shall we? Is there a better way to make element 120? Well, we need our protons to add up. That's the key thing. We can smash two things together, but the whole problem is that Coulomb repulsion. We need to get past Coulomb repulsion. So what if we could take 20 protons, for example, and smash that into uh, uh, 100 protons? So we're looking at 20 protons, that's calcium, smashing it in there. Could we actually do that? The problem is not really. We can only make elements up to 98. Uh, and the reason we do that is we use calcium-48. Calcium-48 is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, it's element 20, as I mentioned. Um, and so you can see it has got a lot of extra neutrons than it should do. Um, because remember, calcium-48, 48, 48 minus 20, that gives you 28 neutrons. These neutrons can be kicked out um, during the, if, if you, bash things together with a particle accelerator and go past that Coulomb repulsion, go through that Coulomb barrier, you've got a lot of energy in there, but you're forming a new nucleus. And then you need to kick out the energy. You need to get rid of it. And the best way to do that is if you've got extra neutrons, because those neutrons can be discarded like a ballast. And hopefully you can get a stable uh, atom, you can get a stable nucleus long enough that you can record it as a new element. So these days we do go past the period, so we do go past the, uh, the, uh, the Coulomb barrier. The problem is that calcium 48, while we can use that, we can get plenty of it, it's really, really great. We can only have substantial quantities of element 98 and 98 plus 20 only gives us 118. We are still shy to protons. So we use element 22, we use titanium to make element 120. That's what we're trying at the moment uh, with a target made of Californian, which is element 98. The titanium 50 has extra neutrons. The problem is titanium 50 isn't as great as calcium 48 because calcium 48 is doubly magic. It is incredibly stable and that really, really helps when we're trying to make elements. So we use a particle accelerator. We don't use something like the Hadron Collider, which can go potentially much more powerful because that's the equivalent of a shotgun blast. What we want is a sniper rifle. We want to have just enough energy to get over the Coulomb barrier. We shoot that target of uh, the heavier 
a metal emulsion ions of, of titanium along uh, the particle accelerator. Two types there. Um, we have Yuri Oganessian, a lovely picture of him, and, uh, and Martin Polyakov there. That's actually the cyclotron that they used in Russia to make element 118. Uh, and that's me. I know I look like Peter Griffin from Family Guy there. It's a terrible photo. Um, but that is uh, a straight particle accelerator, 108 meters long. It's in Darmstadt in Germany. And they basically, basically do the same thing in slightly different ways. It's all about accelerating ions to try and push through the Coulomb barrier with just enough energy to get those protons into place. So this is called hot fusion, 20% the speed of light. The idea is to smash our ion. Again, I've, I know I'm using carbon and carbon there. The idea is to smash our ions into the, uh, the nucleus, the target nucleus. This will obviously be much, much larger because we're looking at element 98 compared to element tw uh, 20. And hopefully it will stay in place and we can discover an element. Now this is where our, uh, our little test will go. So um, we're gonna do a little demo now. Um, William, are you there? Yes, hello. Hello. Um, do you have a bag of marshmallows? I've got several. Fantastic. I'm going to um, stop the share for a moment. Yeah. Um, right. If you can get some volunteers, a bag of marshmallows each, please. Can I have three volunteers, please? Go on. There we go. One. So these marshmallows are representing our titanium ions. And we need something to represent, of course, our target. That is going to be William. You're going to stand at one end of the lecture theatre. William is going to stand at the other. And you are going to pelt him with marshmallows. <laughs> now, if you miss, that's absolutely fine. When we're in a particle accelerator, we're firing about 12 trillion ions a second. It's an awful lot. We get a lot of misses. That's absolutely fine because a nucleus is not a very big target. When we're talking about the target size, we talk about it in barns. And a barn is 10 to the minus 28 meters squared. It is a tiny, tiny target. These days we can hit pico barns, which is an even tinier target. So if you miss that, that's absolutely fine. Now, if it bounces off, William, that's fine too. That counts as fission. That's far more common. But if you can throw a marshmallow into his mouth, <laughs> If you can get that element 22 combining with element 98, we can get element 120. So marshmallow throwers, are you ready? Can you line up or stand up or something? <laughs> Show some willing. And on the count of three, you are just gonna throw, now bear in mind, you're, you're throwing 12 trillion ions a second here. So throw them hard and throw them fast and don't stop going. Just go, 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 go. <laughs> Three, you know, oh, chap in the orange, you are way too. Oh, you're all, you're all doing it. Go on, pelt him, pelt. Faster, 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 faster. Uh, uh, it, have we had any success? Oh my God. <laughs> Do something. <laughs> okay. You, you can stop with the marshmallows. Any marshmallows that have survived, you're welcome to eat them. Did you, William, did you catch one in your mouth? Didn't get any in my mouth, sadly. You didn't get any. We, we haven't discovered an element. But if we had, if we had, wouldn't that have been glorious? I'm going to go back to sharing my screen now. Now, if we had dis discovered it, we go to the next fun part. So we have this, uh, this fusion happening. We have the neutrons flying off. The neutrons are, are basically being discarded like ballast. And suddenly we have a stable nucleus, uh, potentially for only um, milliseconds. We can't actually measure it, um, but we know that it, how super heavy is decay. And that's how we prove it. We prove it through radioactive decay, which we can detect um, when we have uh, a correctly uh, set up detectors in our particle accelerator. And of course, because we know the decay chains of these elements, we know exactly how long they last. If we can show a decay chain, then we know we must have made um, an element with the correct isotopic uh, combination of protons and neutrons. And you can see there, that's the classic peninsula of stability I mentioned. That black line there is the, st is, is the stable um, isotopes that we know of. There's a few little dots over there you can see right towards the, um, the sort of the top right, um, but otherwise incredibly unstable. 
In fact, we know of about 3,000 different isotopes, but only a handful of them are stable. So when you look at the periodic table, that's really just the protons. I mean, that's just like one aspect of it. Um, when it comes to protons and neutrons, we have an awful lot of options. We just have to try it several times. As I mentioned, we need to do it three times to prove that we can actually get this thing to happen. And if that does happen, it's fantastic. We get to choose a name. And this is one of the reasons that I started looking into this whole field. Uh, there was a, an argument um, when four new elements were discovered in the, uh, in the mid 2010s of what we were gonna call them. And there was a suggestion that one of the elements should be called Lemium. So Lemmy was the lead singer of Motorhead. Uh, you might know it as Ace of Spades. Um, you're all probably a little bit young for Motorhead. Uh, maybe I actually saw them once and I couldn't hear for a week afterwards. Incredibly loud band. And that kind of gives you a, a, a hint as to why people wanted to name an animal after him. It's because they are heavy metals. <laughs> I can hear an audible groan. <laughs> But there are rules. Um, so the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry have rules about what you can name an element and you can't name it after the lead singer of your favorite rock band. So all elements with the exception of, um, uh, of the noble uh, gases which have to end in O-N and the, um, the halogens which end in I-N-E all have to end I-U-M these days. You have no option. You can't have gold or lead or, or copper or something like that. You can have no rude words, uh, which is a shame. Uh, the German team who actually named their element Darmstadtium, they're not based in Darmstadt. They are based in a town called Vixhausen. Unfortunately, Vixhausen um, is German slang and it roughly translates as place I go to masturbate. <laughs> so you can't have that as an element name. No former element names. Of course, you can't have two oxygens on the <coughs> table. Um, this causes a problem for things like nipponium, which was used in, in the early 20th century. So that can never be used again. That's why the Japanese team chose to use nihonium, using the alternative name for Japan. You can name it after a mineral. You can name it after a property of the element. Technetium is a great example of that, meaning uh, synthetic or created uh, in Greek. You can name it after a place. So you can name it after Darmstadt, for example, or you can name it after um, Berkeley or Bristol if, uh, if you discover an element there. Uh, there's only one element that is named after a place in the United Kingdom though, that is Strontium, uh, which is named after the tiny village of Strontium in Scotland. Um, and Strontium itself means uh, fairy grove. So Strontium is literally, you know, place of the fairies uh, uh, as an element. Uh, you can name it after a scientist, so Oganesson is a great example of that. Yuri Oganesson is one of the most successful element discoverers. And of course, he has an element named after him. Einsteinium, Fermium, uh, Mendelevium, all great examples. And finally, you can name it after a mythical creature, uh, which is something I absolutely love. My favorite example of that is Cobalt. Uh, cobalt is actually named after the Kobold, which is a German mining spirit that was said to poison iron. Now, there is a computer game called Baldur's Gate, and a kobold is a D&D creature that features in Baldur's Gate. And what they're doing in the computer game is they are poisoning the iron in a mine. So whoever came up with that computer game knew the really niche etymology of the word uh, kobold. Um, I always find that a very geeky little fact to remember. But that gives you an overview of how to discover an element, the techniques used, some of the personalities, some of the reasons and the rationales, and of course, some of the considerations when it comes to things like how we actually name our elements. Um, I've been uh, Kit Chapman. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Chemistry Kit, and I'm more than happy to take your questions on any subject for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, that's good start. <laughs> I have I have one. Um, Go on, to now. clarify when you have the animation when the uh, isotopes were disappearing, were mm. those times the half life of that uh, element? Yes. So so to clarify, those are the half lives of the element. Um, although bear in mind that when we're talking about making a single atom at a time, generally the half lives are the entire existence of that element as well. But yes, it, those are the half lives. You're right. So and have an element that exists for. 
So, um, I, sorry, I, I didn't quite hear the question. It, it, how, what's the shortest time that we can have an element? Is that what the question well, is? So, so you're saying like magnesium, magnesium. Oh, 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 yeah. When that's on last, normally like seconds. Yep. That would be sort of average length of time that lasts. It lasts more short than that end of the time. Precisely. So it's the it's they work out the uh, the uh, the half lives based on the average time, and this is again why we need repetition in in science. Um, the it's, a, it's actually quite an interesting question as to what is the shortest time that we can have an element existing. Um, it's generally considered that anything shorter than um, uh, ten to the minus fourteen seconds would be not a real element because that is the time it takes for a bare cation to attract electrons. So that is, that is like the cutoff period. And if you can't get elements uh, that are stable enough to last that time, do they count as elements at all? Um, it's a question that we don't have to worry about just yet. Although there are theories that when we get to Z equals 140 or so, so 140 protons, that might well start to be a problem. Uh, we might have situations where elements are so short lived, they are not able to attract uh, electrons. They are just bare cations. And then there's the question, are they elements at all? So is that where that two closer table is from? Sorry, I, I, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. So, so you said we estimated that we discovered two thirds of the periodic table, mm. right? Is the final carbon yeah. the table? No, so the, so the estimations are actually based on um, on something called the Dirac C, um, which is basically the idea of uh, which is basically the idea of stability and what is the maximum level of stability that we could have. Uh, it's around Z equals 172, we think. Um, there are a lot of different arguments as to whether or not we could actually have elements beyond that. But again, the question from a chemistry point of view, and it's almost moot given that we can't actually do anything with them chemistry wise. We couldn't make a molecule with an element that's, um, that's so short lived. Um, it becomes a, a more physics question and a, a, sub, a, you know, a theoretical physics question at that as to whether or not an element would count if we discovered uh, with more protons. Any other question? Um, can you talk a bit more about where and why you travelled? Where have I travelled? So uh, I was off the coast of Ecuador, uh, as you are, uh, when the COVID pandemic ha happened. I had actually been going around Cape Horn. Um, I was working on my book, um, Racing Green, and I went down the Amazon River uh, to Manaus to look at rubber plantations. And I sailed down to a shire, which is right at the bottom of Argentina, um, because they were going to hold a, an extreme E uh, electric race there uh, with lithium ion battery cars. And then I was working my way up past the Atacama Desert because um, I was looking into how we actually create um, <laughs> fertilizer uh, as part of the Harbour Bosch process. Before that, we actually used um, guano bird droppings from the Atacama Desert, incredibly dry, so the bird droppings stay there. And I got to Ecuador, and of course, everything shuts down. So I have to catch a boat back to the United Kingdom um, because I can't get a flight anywhere. Uh, sailed across the Atlantic. Really, really strange voyage. And I was in lockdown and I just sold my house. I thought I'm going to go traveling for a little bit. I'll buy a house when I get back home in the United Kingdom. I'll find somewhere to rent. And of course, the rental market had seized up in, in 2020. There was no one buying or renting houses. So I was in an Airbnb and I thought, I could be an Airbnb anywhere in the world. Why am I in the United Kingdom? What's the benefit here? And so I flew to South Korea and they imprisoned me in a hotel room. Uh, I wasn't allowed to leave the room for 14 days. Um, I went a little bit mad. Um, and, uh, and then they let me into the country. So three months in South Korea in pretty much no lockdown. There were only, I think, 20 cases of COVID in South Korea while I was there because of their very, very strict lockdown policies. Um, and then I spent most of the time in South America. I went back to Guatemala, Costa Rica, Colombia, Panama, a um, bit of time in Mexico as well. Um, and a lot of this has actually been working on my next book. Um, and I've started doing some preliminary work for that. I can't tell you what it is, but I'm, I'm really kind of excited by what I've been finding out. So in answer to your question, I spent a lot of time trying to find El Dorado uh, when I was, was in South America during the pandemic. Yes. Uh, what is your first book about? So my first book was Super Heavy, uh, which was about super heavy elements and creation of elements. Uh, my second one uh, is about racing uh, technology and spin-off technologies. And this is one of those really interesting things is that 
when I first began looking into super heavy elements, I never imagined there was going to be a book about them. Uh, I was looking into it because I was working for Chemistry World magazine. Obviously, the creation of elements is a huge deal for chemistry. We've only got 118 of them. And so I was looking for a scoop. And um, when the element names were announced, I decided to send Yuri Oganessian an email. I thought, I, know, I don't know if he speaks English. Um, I don't know anything about the man, really, because he's a physicist and it's not an area that I'm an expertise in. Um, and he spoke perfect English, was incredibly friendly and said, well, well, why don't you come over to Dubna in Russia and I will show you exactly how I make elements. And so I traveled over to Moscow, uh, 60 miles up north um, into Dubna, um, a very, very traditional Russian town. Um, it's what's called a Naukograd, which is a science town. Um, you've got murals on the buildings still from the, uh, from the Cold War. They only had a supermarket uh, about 10 years ago introduced into the town. Um, there are only two hotels. One is a Game of Thrones theme hotel, um, which I didn't even know. <laughs> the other one, which is the one sadly that I got put into, was from the, uh, from the Cold War. And there was a floor that you could not access by elevator, um, which was apparently where the KGB used to spy on all of the rooms. Um, so we're talking really going back into the Cold War. Um, the first night we were there, the, the heating kicked on. It was incredibly hot. And I, I went over to my friend's room and said, you know, the, the heating's really hot. He's like, mine too. Um, and we had these windows open to cool us down. We asked the Russians in the, mo in the morning what happened. And they went, well, we, we have sort of central committee heating. You have central heating. We've got central committee heating. Someone in, in the mayor's office decides when it's cold and they turn on the heating for the entire town and we can't turn it off. <laughs> so that's kind of how they're still operating in Russia. Um, it's the only time, I know I'm lying, I got had a gun pulled on me in China as well, but it's the only time I've always almost been shot by the military. So we were going into uh, Dogma, the, the, the actual um, Joint Institute for Nuclear Research where they actually got the machines. And the Russian military were looking after it and there was this incredibly officious man with a huge hat on. Um, and we were going through and someone hadn't told them that we were bringing cameras. And suddenly these AK-47s were being raised and there was a lot of very angry words in Russian. We were thinking, what do we do? Fortunately, someone translated, we sort of left. Um, and I spoke to someone afterwards and he said, we managed to get through by, by talking to the head of security. And he said, the head of security was like, you stupid fool. Why don't you just drive in like a normal person? You know, my guards are so crap, they never actually check the boot. You could have hidden your stuff in there. And that kind of gives you an idea of to sort of the mentality of, of, of Russia. I just thought it was a, a fascinating insight in that they were so worried about these cameras, but all, if we had just driven them in and kind of played the game, there would have been no problem at all. Sorry, that was completely not the question you asked, but. <laughs> Any other questions? Why did you have a gun pulled on you in China? Um, yeah, that was, so that was my fault. Um, <laughs> so I grew up in Hong Kong and uh, I went to school in a place called Stanley Fort in the, uh, the south of Hong Kong. And I thought I was there um, on holiday and I thought, you know what, it'd be quite nice to visit my old school. Um, and I hadn't realized that that was now a Chinese military base. <laughs> and so trying to sneak into a Chinese military base really doesn't go down very, very well. Um, and yeah, um, that, I, was, I was politely asked to leave is the best way to put it. Any questions? Okay. Um, do you want to show us your um, periodic table? Quickly? On my periodic table, sure. So I have to move my PEZ dispensers out of the way because for some reason I have a row of PEZ. So this is a periodic table and it is actually signed by every single living element discoverer, including that's Yuri Organessian right at the end there. So we've got the Japanese team, the German teams, um, everyone who's discovered a super heavy element um, and is still alive. So Glenn Seaborg died in the 1990s. Algi also sadly um, died about 12 years ago, but um, I have everybody else's signatures. So um, it's, it's one of my favorite things. Brilliant. Um, nothing else? In that case, um, thank you very much, Kit. Um,
Pizza should be here in about five minutes. So if you just want to hang about, it will be dished out in Fizz Bar. Um, chat amongst yourselves, I guess, for now. And thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. I sorry I couldn't be there in person. <laughs>